great. There you go. Uh, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor William Frankie, Professor of Complete at Vanderbilt. When uh, this project got the green light, one of the things that I thought I would do would be uh, read as much stuff as I could from uh, all of the authors and from the um, innumerable possibilities uh, from uh, Professor Frankie. I, I decided that this would be my reading, the book of uh, Dante's Paradiso and the Theological Origins of Modern Thought, which I read uh, with great um, pleasure and profit. And it was only today that I put together the fact that this also was published by Rutledge. And so I, I don't think it's like a crazy wild thought to put the two things together. And, you know, I, I wonder whether our getting the green light might have had something to do with the fact that they already had published this and uh, realized that that Paradiso is a good thing. Uh, but in any case, whether or not that that fantasy is true, uh, it, it's a, a great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome your presentation with them. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. And um, I'm going to start from the ambiguity of the word end in the title that, that you and Filippo assigned to me for a reading of the, the last canto, Paradiso 33. The end can mean a, a consummation, but also a cutting off. And Dante's vision is consummated, of course, in God, the end of all desires, fine di tutti visi, as the canto says. But the end specifically of imagination in this last canto is also its final defeat and surrender before the unrepresentable. In the very last stroke before the final vision is consummated in the concluding lines of the poem, Dante resorts to the figure of a lightning bolt, which his mind is struck by, and its wish is granted, right? Sua voglia venne. Yet he notes at the same time that high fantasy here lost its power, manco possa. The faculty of imagining or fantasizing is finally dumbstruck as Dante enters into a purely intellectual vision of divinity that cannot be remembered or represented. He mentions this repeatedly from the beginning that nearing its desire, our intellect, nostro intelletto, so deepens to such an extent that memory to not follow after. His human faculties, his own wings, as he puts it, prove inadequate to attain to this ultimate vision. It's granted him only by divine grace. Now the reference to wings here is reminiscent of Ulysses, the oars of whose ship had been turned into the wings of his mad flight. The inscrutable will of God that damns Ulysses saves Dante. The very same phrase, as pleased another, come altrui piacque, qualifies both events and casts its long shadow over the whole poem's great adventure as it pivots from this closing lightning bolt. That Dante's own means, his wings, are unequal to the humanly impossible undertaking goes both for his means as a pilgrim to the vision of God and for his means as the poet of the Paradiso. Indeed, the word penne used here for Dante's wings also means pen or quill. So Ulysses' failure, despite all his art, both as navigator and as rhetor, remains in these ways integral to Dante's final triumph or God's final triumph. Dante fails humanly like Ulysses, yet he succeeds divinely by the grace of God in passing beyond ordinary mortal limits, exactly what Ulysses was condemned for. Dante's been insisting throughout the Paradiso, and especially in the Empyrean, that his vision transcends the senses and the closely associated dependent faculty of imagination. Still, he relies entirely on just these faculties in order to convey some inkling of his experience to us, and even to grasp and hang on to it himself, since as such, the divine vision evades his memory. Only the effects it leaves imprinted on his mind and emotions can be culled and communicated as traces or vestiges of this otherwise incommunicable vision. He's describing only the effect on him of his encounter with divinity, 
what he felt in the aftermath of the vision. He's like one waking from a dream that he cannot remember. All that remains is the passion it impressed on him. He senses the vision residually as a sweetness that continues to be distilled into his heart. That dulcedo is really a, a cipher of the, the whole mystical tradition, which I'll bring up a little bit later. Not the vision itself, but these subjective correlatives of it are what Dante can describe. And he does so by marshalling the rich resources of his imagination, even though the vision itself in the Empyrean, which is outside space and time, has to be understood as imageless. Imagination fails Dante in the ultimate outrageous thrust, taking him beyond his natural limits. Nevertheless, Dante gives us nothing but images together with their associated emotions to interpret his visio dei. This final vision unfolds essentially in a series of three images punctuated by exclamations of Dante's utter inability to describe what he saw, conjoined with appeals for divine assistance. Each of these images takes up two tercets. First, Dante sees a book bound together by love in a single volume that internalizes stinterna, the entire universe, within the Trinitarian threefold, which you hear in the ter, even in the interna. He believes, credo, that he sees the whole universe gathered and tied together in this way into a knot, nodo, of love, because he feels himself exulting all the more as he says so. By this telling, what is represented as seen in the vision is an inference from the feeling produced by his saying and representing it. He takes his feeling of joy in recounting how he saw the whole universe with all its substance and accidents conflated together into a simple light to be the only proof left to him of the vision itself since it cannot as such be remembered. Similarly, the last two visions, which concern the three diversely colored and inwardly linked circles representing the three persons of the Trinity, render lively images for what remains supposedly in itself unchanging and indeed imageless. The second circle is generated from the first as one rainbow is born by reflection from another, while the third is breathed like fire equally from the first two. And then finally, the humanly imaged Christ within the second circle in the third vision adds further to the proliferation of images. These visions furthermore are impossible to explain in the representation of the theological mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation, just as it is mathematically impossible to square or measure the circle as recalled by the figure of the exasperated geometer. To the very end of his poem, Dante uses images, especially geometrically precise images, to signal this impasse. Yet they work actually as anti-images for the imageless. Even the infinitesimally small vanishing point that has been used to represent divinity ever since the prima mobile and still in the Empyrean is a metaphor for the invisible. It causes Dante more forgetfulness or letargo than the whole of recorded history, the 25 centuries since the first recorded human sea voyage, that of the Argo. This event made the god Neptune marvel as he saw the passing shadow of the ship on the surface of the sea above him. Even the divine vision of the pagan sea god discerns only the shadow, the effect reflected in passing of a reality that remains in itself invisible to him. Now, what's so provocative about this image is that the place of the unseen transcendent reality is occupied by the Greek hero Jason, who like Ulysses is an emblem of human creativity, industry, audacity, which are thereby apotheosized. The images that Dante's own human artwork, his poem conveys are only artifices, not the divine vision itself. Yet Dante also claims that his text, his artifact, becomes a locus of divine revelation. It is finally in the obliteration of images and memory that Dante is miraculously granted to see 
the eternal. Still, as far as Dante and we can tell, the event of the eternal happens, ineffability and all, within his discourse, interrupted by narrative impasses and obliterated images. Now, what I'm trying to suggest here is that the insistence of these images for the imageless vision intimates that the vision itself may, after all, be only ambiguously other than the images that Dante's poem contemplates with such burning ardor. While God or absolute reality is beyond words and language and imagination, Dante seems to achieve and transmit access to this ultimate vision precisely through these linguistic and imaginative means. On condition, of course, that language and imagination negate themselves, like the snow that unseals itself in the sun, and like the oracles of Sybil that disperse themselves in the wind passing through her cave. Only so can the circle be squared. The human, the square, is integrated into the divine, the circle, beyond human doing and art, in their surrender and self-sacrifice to an event of grace beyond human capacity. It is when Dante's ardor finishes and his mind is struck by lightning that the vision is completely consummated and his will satisfied. Like Dionysius the Areopagite along the Via Negativa, Dante achieves his vision precisely in and by its coming undone and by his letting go of it. His human representations need to dissolve and disperse themselves in order to let divine truth itself shine out or shine through the poem. The poem presents itself through similes and images such as Sybil and the melting snow as devolving into a state of decomposition or self-dismantling. Yet the unrepresentable reality or truth that is divinity and very God self is perhaps, at least for the reader, only ambiguously other than all its failed representations. It is only in the experience of totalizing representations breaking open to all they cannot encompass that a human realization of divinity or transcendence of the oneness of the many, as in the book image, comes to pass. At least this is what Dante's poem is able to convey concretely of his vision, which may for Dante himself have been mystical in some sense that God only knows. The key role that imagination plays in the divine comedy still at its very highest reaches is due to the fact that imagination in its self-subversive, self-overcoming operation can interpret our relationship to the unrepresentable as well as to everything that can be concretely experienced and represented. Imagination invents images for the whole, for all of reality, which can never be grasped as such conceptually. The whole comedia is leveraged from what cannot be imagined, but nonetheless drives Dante's desire and our own. The all-encompassing good, the object of all willing, is everywhere else defective and is perfect only there, li, that is, in the divine essence into which Dante finally peers. The will is then finally whole and unified only in desiring God and God alone. As Dante arrives at this point, Nothing outside of or beyond God can be desired. Imagining the unrepresentable whole is, in general, central to all our experience, whatever, as it passes through the filters of culture. I think there's always some kind of a whole operative in our thinking, even when we're not thinking about it. We resort to imagination still today to furnish some way of coping with political, social, environmental challenges that are global and as such surpass our capabilities of conceptual representation. Everything in the poem, especially since the beginning of the Paradiso, has been nothing if not so many anticipations of the final event, the vision of God, and of the universe in its wholeness that takes place in the final canto. In a strict sense, this event can only be anticipated and can never actually be registered or conveyed as such. It's nothing if not a projection from its anticipations. Dante can offer only images for the imageless vision that in itself evades being rendered visible or even intelligible. This, thus, everything in the poem and in the universe is understood in relation to what Dante and we cannot understand, such as Dante's visionary form of learned ignorance. 
to evoke the formula consecrated by the wisdom of the ages transmitted through Christian tradition and its precedents, notably Neoplatonic, the thinking of the transcendence of the one, for instance. The vision of God with which the poem ends is the origin of the journey and the indispensable spark of inspiration for Dante's whole poetic project, recounting his otherworldly journey. The vision of God is humanly impossible. So St. Bernard's prayer to the Virgin supplicates her for gratia, the framing of the final canto by the prayer to the Virgin highlights the accomplishment of the humanly impossible, right? With God, all things are, how shall this be? I, since I know not a man. Dante claims throughout his poem, but definitively in its last canto, that the impossible has come to pass, or rather comes to pass. This is not an event that can be reported as a past fact. It can only be entered into and be experienced in the present, in the eternal present of the iterations of poetry as the actualization of the real in language. A performative dimension is necessary for this event to be realized. The divine presence that is actualized belongs to the sphere of the eternal, yet it is actualized in time and specifically in the body. Dante's poetic approach to the divine vision, which in itself is purely intellectual, according to the mystics, expresses this vision in an imaginative medium that is entangled with and dependent on bodily form and matter. At the poem's end, high fantasy fails. And yet Dante indicates that his will is placated because he is absorbed into pure intellect as manifest paradigmatically in the moving of the planets and stars by the angelic intelligences. Still any trace of this movement beyond self-will any expression of his metaphysical transumption can only be imaginative and thus bodily in form. It is in this regard poetic, yet negatively poetic. It must cancel itself out in opening toward the absolutely transcendent. The images Dante uses to present this vision are not it, at least in principle. The vision itself, the visio dei on which Dante's poem is based, takes place not in finite time. It belongs instead to eternity. But its readerly realization is in time. And then not just in the time of Dante's singular experience, which has a depth dimension of infinity already in itself, but also in the collective experience of generations of readers, which likewise remains open to infinity. Dante's singular experience of eternity or of God can be validated only by other individuals and their own singular experiences. This transmission entails an epiphany ignited and guided by the experience of poetic language as provoking a revelatory event, in effect, an original repetition of the divine word in Dante's poem. Dante's final prayer to the divinity to grant just so much power to his language that a single spark of your glory may be left to future generations, reprises the prologue prayer where, of, the, of the Paradiso, where Dante had prayed that some spark of his vision be preserved and ignite greater talents than his own. In both cases, Dante prays not for himself. His purpose is rather that some spark of his vision should be left to future followers, explicitly poets, but in any case also readers. The divine vision of the poem is meant to confer a saving knowledge generally for all humanity. The letter to Can Grande makes that explicit. But Dante, in effect, fuses his vision with his poem in handing it over to his readers, there to be guided to the experience of truth revealed in the poem by the grace of God. Intriguingly and ambiguous, the final image of the book of the universe is an image not only of God as a book, but also of the book that Dante's divine comedy has become, right? This is the, 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 the book that folds all substance and accidents into itself bound by love. Dante realizes the divine event of the visio dei in the actuality of his literary work. The acts of reading and writing become the vision itself by their capacity to actualize it. What is accomplished in poetry remains always still to be accomplished in the eternal repetitions of the text. 
the text remains always available to be recited anew. And in fact, only in its reenactments and in specific instances of reading does it exist concretely. The realization or execution of the poem and its vision does not take place for Dante alone, but is to be completed and carried out by his readers. The poem remains structurally open to its readers by being intrinsically addressed to them from the very first line implicitly with its reference to our life, nostra vita, and then explicitly in the series of addresses to the reader that punctuates its various turning points and frame the poem and its vision as a whole and make it an event of truth that individual readers are summoned to realize in their own readings. This orientation to others collectively is of a piece with the ambiguous presence and role in the poem of the body. The poem pivots on Dante's historical and bodily life as an individual, but at the same time, Dante's experience assumes the dimension of a universal experience of humankind and, and even of the world beyond time, the, the Christian afterlife. The poem nevertheless dwells imminently in this world and its bodily representations in valorizing the otherworldly. In fact, as has long been observed, one can cite Hegel, Dante's other worlds are this world represented as eternalized in its ultimate ethical and spiritual significance. As explained by Aristotle and as embraced by scholastic philosophy, imagination is bound to the body and the senses. This would be a reason for totally transcending it in the purely intellectual vision of God at the culmination of the Paradiso. But imagination is also the premise and enabling condition for the whole of the Commedia. Paradoxically, in spite of this transcendence into the eternal and divine, Dante's poetic project realizes itself as radically incarnate, as grounded in the body and the concrete history of an individual that so distinguish his method and style and so vitalize the pages of his poem. Body-bound imagination is crucial to the whole imaginary extravaganza of the Commedia. The eruption of the body into Dante's journey to beatitude, culminating in the vision of God, reflects the revolution in ancient, particularly Platonic thought, brought about by Christianity through its doctrine of the incarnation of the word, which underwrites its mystical belief in the resurrection of the flesh. The Empyrean, with its resurrected bodies, is the true reality of which all else is but figures, only shadowy prefaces. Dante's imaginative writing gives to the reader a concrete object, which nevertheless is only a trace of the reality that it evokes and indicates without exhausting or even presenting it. The poem is thus a revelation in the equivocal sense of a revealing, a representing in figures based necessarily on bodily senses of the divine word that as Augustine insists, is not sensible but cannot otherwise be communicated to humans as composite creatures composed of body and soul. The sensations of paradise that are produced by physical phenomena in the nine physical heavens are only images for the direct inner spiritual experience of divine presence in the Empyrean that can be communicated humanly by no other means. Paradiso in its entirety consists in sensory imagery for an experience that is purely intellectual. Accordingly, Dante's intellectual vision has often been understood as a mystical experience. He travels through the nine physical heavens in his body, but only as a way of signifying something else transcending physical reality. He's given to see the blessed souls only by accommodation, by supernatural condescension to the level of his mortal nature with its sensory limits, as is made explicit in the fourth canto of the Paradiso. In the end, Dante claims direct vision of divinity, but his language and imaginings are finally negative. They cancel themselves out in attaining the true vision that can come only unmediated from God. This is the point of the references to Sybil and the self-unsealing snow, as well as to Neptune's seeing of shadows. The same for the poem's representations even of the Empyrean is still consisting only in shadowy prefaces. The Ulysses motif too makes the same point that divine grace succeeds only where human power fails. And the same must be said again of the image of the infant feeding at the breast 
the speechless infant emphasizes Dante's utter impotence vis-a-vis -vis the vision granted. This human weakness reverses itself and opens into a channel for receiving divine empowerment. Similarly, Dante's forgetting with his finite human mind turns his letargo into a susceptibility or passivity capable of accessing the higher mind of God. Despite their self-subversion, the imaginative means of mediation remain essential. They can even be considered one with the vision itself. These images become true to the extent that they are recognized as poetic fictions. They point to and take us to a deeper source of truth that belongs to an absolute realm that can only be projected negatively from all that Dante and we can say and imagine or even conceive. The writing creates an experience of an impasse to writing and reason discourse, and even to continue as narrative. It thus imposes a necessity of transcending these imminent means of human expression and understanding. This is the reason why in the end, and as the condition of finally achieving the vision, fantasy has to finish. Or does imagination itself finish the vision in the sense of putting the finishing touches on it that make it happen? This question has been urged on us, especially throughout the Empyrean, and comes to its crisis point in the final canto. Direct vision of God happens, at least for us concretely as readers, only in the experience of poetic language, reflecting on this language's own self-reflexive essence. Self-reflexivity is the nature of the inner life of the divine trinity itself. This is perfectly expressed and realized in the self-reflexively saturated language of the Paradiso culminating in its final vision, eminently in the verses, O eternal light who dwell in yourself alone, alone know yourself, and intellecting yourself, understand and love yourself, and smile. Dante also says, however, that in the Empyrean, he finally sees the faces, these of the blessed, that he could not see when he asked St. Benedict, and again, St. John, the evangelist, and was told that he would not be able to do so until precisely this moment, when he is at last in the Empyrean. The faces emerge like people formerly masked, to form the celestial rose perceived by the spiritual senses through which Dante ingests and tastes and smells divine light. Does this synesthetic Sabbath sight not belong to what cannot properly be remembered and described? It is a supernaturally granted vision that exceeds all natural capacities to remember or convey. Any description of it can only be poetic invention and metaphor as already in the mystic tradition handed down to Dante from Dionysius the Areopagite through Richard of St. Victor, Bernard of Clairvaux, Bonaventure. Technically, this is vision by the glorious light, Lumen Gloriae, that belongs to the beatific vision of blessed souls after death, according to Thomas Aquinas. Dante enters into such vision in the Empyrean when he sees the image of the river of light that makes the creator visible to the creature. Aquinas distinguishes carefully between prophecy and the mystic vision of God's essence. Prophecy is inspired by God, but involves the use of imagination and sensory images to communicate its message to humans. A raptus, on the other hand, entails knowing of the divine essence by grace extending beyond human capabilities. Paul and Dante alike remain prophets even while passing into mystic vision. They conflate the roles of prophet and mystic because Paul is only ambiguously separated from the body because his raptus is for the purpose of a testimony, right? He has to bring it back. And so does Dante. Dante's vision is for the purpose of writing his poem in Pro del Mondo. Both their visions have to be at least equivocally corporeal in order to be communicable. Dante posits a transition at the end of his poem and journey from the prophetic mode that he has exercised all throughout the comedy to the direct intuitive mode of seeing God's essence. But he cannot convey the latter by his linguistic and imaginative means, except indirectly. 
There is a leap of faith here at the conclusion of the work and thus at the origin of Dante's entire project. This holds for us as his readers who are asked to believe that his prophetic revelations are based on a divine revelation that he cannot actually share with us. But the same holds even for Dante himself, since the direct knowledge of the divine essence and truth is nothing that he can cognitively master or even remember. His final lines and the final canto as a whole testify to his faith that the incommunicable intellectual vision of the divine essence actually transpired. Only the poem itself remains as a kind of proof of the infinite depth and absolute intensity of the vision from which it proceeds. What Dante offers concretely, especially in the Paradiso, is a language mysticism, an experience of language itself as enacting the Trinitarian self-reflexivity of the Godhead and the symbolic ap apotheosis of meaning in humanly accessible material form as incarnation of the divine word. Dante's Paradiso offers thus an embodiment in poetic language of the visio dei. Dante's Aristotelian philosophical reflections is pursued in the Convivio, but also in the Commedia and all through the Paradiso, gives central importance to bodily incarnate human nature and to language and imagination as mediating divinity expressed in the world. Like religious rite, poetry repeats an original event in language, a language of its own making, and thereby reenacts the origin of the universe. That's already suggested in Inferno One. This can also be an event of salvation from the fallenness of history. The rhythmic language of poetry with its lyric self-reflexivity becomes a ritual reenactment of eternity in time. This is a collective enactment in ritual and poetry that becomes liturgical, literally a work of the people. It constitutes a collective embodiment through a tradition of reading that is expressly hoped for and evoked in the poem. Dante's prophetic revelation in the Commedia might best be seen as a simulation of the divine vision in a ritual poetic performance guided by grace. Prophecy works through imagination, but it can end by God's grace or divine light in mystic vision, direct intuition of the divine essence. Dante does claim to have seen God directly. He proclaims this revelation of the word and celebrates his personal theophany. At the same time, he has shared with us also his negative theological reflection foregrounding how the condition for seeing God is a thoroughgoing negation of any kind of literal vision of an object and negation even of oneself in order to be taken up into an event that surpasses the human self and its finite boundaries. From his beginnings in the Vita Nuova, Dante's not been able to describe realistically his vision of Beatrice because she was to him the revelation of divine glory. He has all along resorted to the ineffability topos that reaches its last paroxysm in the final canto of the Paradiso. This condition of unrepresentability impinges on what Dante does represent from his first book to his last. What Dante makes present in the default of representation is what can be called a formal reality, a reality that is first discovered through poetic language. It can be understood philosophically through some of the most advanced and challenging ideas circulating in Dante's medieval scholastic culture. Paradiso and most concentratedly its last canto presents a formal reality in the sense defined by Dan Scotus. And I'm actually not going to have the time to, 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 to really explain this, except to suggest that it's a, an interactive reality, that, that it's not like the things that are, are simply there that anyone can see. It, it depends on the relationship that one has. But all of our concepts are like this, according to Dan Scotus, right? You know, hoarseness, doesn't exist. It's you, you look at all the horses, you don't find horses. But in the mind's interaction, well, yes, it's not just subjective. You know, there is something shared in common by those individuals, and, and that is real. It's a formal reality. And, you know, today we can talk about this in terms of virtual reality as a reality that's dependent on a principle outside it that is not directly experienced. Now, to conclude, the Augustinian intuition of the divine essence, which is itself an adaptation of the Platonic philosopher's unmediated vision of the good at the summit of the divine line, of the divided line, 
was represented at the University of Paris in the mid 13th century signally by Saint Bonaventure. Thomas Aquinas was skeptical about such direct intuition. Working from Aristotle, but against Averroes, Aquinas based our knowledge of God instead on knowing created things as effects of their divine cause, the creator and first mover. Dante has the two Parisian masters dancing together in separate but complementary circles of wise spirits in the heaven of the sun. Both visions were true for him in different ways. He held them together in harmonious tension all the way through to his final vision at the end of the Paradiso. He hypothesizes an unmediated vision of divinity beyond all limits of finitude and corporeality. But he also embraces the body as the locus of a radically new type of revelation in the flesh. Bonaventure himself had stressed the corporeal stigmata of St. Francis as indispensable path markers on the journey of the mind to God. Right? The theological paradox of the incarnation which is brought to night sharp focus thematically in the prayer to the Virgin is poetically performed by Dante in his imageless vision, finally rendered in arresting images at the end of the Paradiso. Dante's endlessly provocative insinuation is that he, is, that he not only saw God in the flesh, but that his imaginative cre creation of poetic language serves as the catalyst by which God makes this event happen in his soul and in the souls of believers with sufficient faith, or equivalently in the souls of readers with sufficient ingeniousness in imagining. Both dispositions require openness to the unknown. Dante's writing is about how writing, which unfolds also the act of reading, becomes itself a mystical experience or at least breaks open to a mystic dimension of experience. As I understand him, Dante's reduction of his vision to writing does not de-theologize it, but rather theologizes it to the nth degree. Writing is a secularization of revelation, but secularization in this negative or apophatic vein is divine revelation, God coming into the world. The poem's completeness as a linguistic human work and act, reaches out to include more than itself, building into it an orientation to what transcends it, to absolute alterity, the ineffably other divinity. That's where I end. Thank you. Well, thank you. Wow. Um, Questions, comments. Um, what <clears throat> one thing I would say that uh, was um, quite wonderful it was the number of different ways in which you linked it to what um, you know the previous chapters are are doing. Uh, that you you took it as a kind of. Uh, um, you know, in in taking the last canto and and um, opening it up that thoroughly, uh, it just pretty much casts light back on everything that we've been saying for the last many many months. So uh, thank you for that, among other things. Well, I've learned a lot every time, and actually, I had to restrain myself. I would have liked to make many more references to what has come up in previous sessions, mm -hmm. but you know, I had to really. And and the other way around, I'm going to go back and you know put some of that stuff uh, in, in there as anticipatory. Uh, uh, Akash, you're uh, ready to go. Yeah, thank you, William. That was that was lovely, provocative. Uh, uh, it's an early hour here on the West Coast, so it's it's heady stuff for <laughs> this uh, this particular moment. But uh, a couple of things that uh, I you know was struck by. Uh, and wonder if you might elaborate on or, or think about a little bit with me. Uh, one of them is uh, you talked about knotted images. You talked about the no, though, uh, in such close proximity to the, you know, beautiful, always wonderful image to talk about of the universe bound by love in one volume. Uh, it, it occurs to me that looking at 
amore and no though in close proximity to one another there is also a moment to maybe think about how they also come up in conjunction in Purgatorio 24 and thinking about lyric love poetry uh, when Bonajunta talks about the nodo uh, that is separating him and Guitone and Giacomo Valentini and others from the Dolce Stil Novo. So I wonder if you might think about that lyric history and, and how that might apply to you know, something still being present there in the final vision. It's a Visio Dei, but it's also a Visio Dantes, right? And I think there's something interesting about that in terms of his own history and his own always present identity as a love poet. Uh, so that's one. And then the other one is... Can we maybe I, I talk about that and, and then come back to your second? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Just because that's so so rich already, you know, rather than forgetting it. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yes, go ahead. You know, that's what's so amazing about Dante's poems. Everything ties together, literally. You know, the, and sure, you know, his adventure of love, you know, in, um, let's see, yeah, in 24, and but it goes through 26 here of, of Purgatory, um, is, is still absolutely present and being relived. And you, you give us the lexical link there, this nodo. I think what becomes clear from the perspective of Paradiso 33 is the way in which a nod is also an impasse, right? Um, but, but I think that's also very relevant. And then that's what he's saying, right? Uh, you know, in Bona Junta, you know. Um, it, it's an impasse, but that's also the, you know, the very nature of, of God is to, to, to have everything knotted together, you know, in this absolute unity uh, it's a it's a coincidence of opposites, I I think. But you know the the knot as as something that needs to be undone um, because it is an impasse, and yet you need it. Uh, you you have to go back into it, right? To lose yourself into it once again. That, that's the nature of love. That's the nature of the you know the, the final vision of God. The, you know who is love at at the very end. And so sure, this knot image I I think is really right on the mark and thanks for tying that back then to his lyric experience and you could do a lot with that image interculturally as as, as well the, the the vedas and uh, um you know the that that knot of love is 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 really a universal archetype i think that that ties many cultures together as well so yeah thanks so much for that and we, we do want to get your your second point as well yeah no thank you well and it's it's related to what you just did in that comparative mystical mode of uh thinking about uh you know multiplicity of of global traditions together and i wonder you know if if you're going to do that in a, in the more elaborate version of the chapter at all because i know that you you do wonderful things with comparative mysticism um so on that you know in that vein uh i think there's there's something I was really struck by the way that you were talking about the the writing of the poem, right? The volume is also the the poem itself, of course, and the writing of the poem is also, you know, getting to the point of the ultimate vision, and the reading of the poem is also getting to the point of that ultimate vision. Um, and so it 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 reminded me of something that I know you're familiar with, which is the 12th century uh, Persian mystical work. Conference of the Birds by, by Farid al uh, and that way of thinking about how all of us together are the thing itself, right, are the vision itself, uh, that reveal at the end of all of these birds are going out in the, in search of the, uh, the, the ultimate bird, right, the Simurg, and, and then the reveal at the end is, oh my goodness, all of us together are exactly the thing that we've been seeking all along. And so I wonder if that has some kind of, uh, resonance with with what you've been talking about today yeah it definitely does and i think that you know we triangulate on the issues of of mysticism some kind of you know ultimate vision by comparing the, the different traditions they you know they have different strengths and you know then some aspects are shadowed uh or more obscure so you know it, it really is a, a method for exploring uh, from all the, the the different points of view, and I, I think that you know, what one thing that I learned by comparative approaches to 
mysticism in this case is that you know any of our our formulations are always relative right and that's that helps you know getting perspective from from different cultures the actual formulation and even you know when we say so we are you know sure you know um this uh realization comes through very much and you know, we are the body of christ for example in in christian tradition um it's also i think we are and we are not um that is it's not we as we apprehend ourselves right in the present it's it's a, a projective a projection to infinity you know of what we could be um and you know, I I do think that these are the sorts of uh, of insights that we can can elicit from comparing mysticism. So it's the, the, the religions they come to loggerheads on you know dogmas, but they're, then they're always the mystics. You know, the, the, the Sufis they can always the mystics always understand each other. You know, across traditions, uh, in spite of you know whatever the doctrinal and, and then you know political differences are. So that's a very a very fertile field, and I, you know, the, the, those of us interested and tuned in to those discourses, I think, you have to, you know, bring that into into the light. Uh, we, we we really need it in, in a world where so much darkness uh, prevails. Thank you for those reflections, Akash. And yeah, let's continue to to, to think along those lines together. So. I'll, I'll, I'll continue along that line uh, with a question more linked to the philosophical tradition from which Dante is working. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to state this question properly because I'm kind of still thinking about it. But the question is the following. So as you, in the monarchy, in the first book, Dante says that the purpose of, or end of the human race is to actualize continually the entire capacity of the possible intellect primarily in speculation and then in action. And that peace is necessary for that process to be actualized. And it seems also to imply that it can only be realized by whole humanity together, right? And that has been, um, that has sparked a whole discussion about whether Dante buys into the um, Averroist view on the possible intellect and basically the, continuation of the individual only within a collective, basically. Um, I don't buy in that, in, into that argument, but I do think that Dante is dealing with this problem, right? Do, and even when he gets to Paradiso, can he alone have a vision of God? Can he reach that full vision alone as an individual? So this is the first question to which I connect something you said in passing about the resurrected body in the Empyrean, which not not everybody agrees that the Bianca Stolle, the, the white garments or gowns that Dante sees mean the resurrected body as Chiavacci Leonardi suggests. I, I do think that that's true and that might be part of how Dante figures out the whole issue of how am I going to see God, and here I'm oversimplifying because I'm a simple mind, but how am I going to see God entirely, you know, if not in that moment in which, you know, in the eschaton, basically, I have to break through time and get there when that is happening, that the whole of humanity with older bodies is contemplating God, which is fascinating to me because uh, it perhaps takes takes care of some of those issues of, you know, how, how can that contemplation be actually, be actualized, not actually, be actualized if not as a, as a collective, both individual and collective. Right. So, sorry, it's a bit convoluted. No, 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 it's no, a, no. It's an ongoing question no. for me. Right. And, well, and of course, Dante is not going to choose one or, or the other, right? He is in so many ways, this first modern European individual, he's really opening that, you know, the, the self-reflexivity constitutive of, of individuality, but it is intersubjective. And um, 
he really overcomes that dichotomy as he does with with almost every other dichotomy. And I, you know, I think he's very inspired by the, you know, the the Arabic vision of of universal humanity and the the, the concept of the potential intellect from Aristotle, from the anima, as it you know goes through the interpretive tradition, that is our universal humanity. Um, and he, he, he embraces that. It's the philosophical vanguard of his day. But no, you know, that I, he's also then his, you know, his Christian orthodoxy helps him, I think, to, to, to valorize the singularity of, of the individual, his individual experience. Um, is it's indispensable for his poem, for everything that he does, for what he offers to us in order to pursue our own singular experience. Um, and, you know, it, it, it has to be both. It's only through the, through your, your own singular mystical tuning in that you're going to, and that we're going to find this community. Um, you know, the, there are, as Dante constantly says, there, there are things that we really cannot understand conceptually, intellectually, um, but he works through these images and he knows that they're not ultimate. And he, so you, you, you go both, you go down both tracks of, you know, the pursuing individual enlightenment and then also recognizing the, the, the collective nature of of intellect, that intellect transcends the, the individuals and subsumes us into a higher collectivity. Those are discourses, languages. We need both of those languages in order to try to, over, it's, it's at the limits where each fails really to you know, grasp the ultimate truth that we, we open to the, the experience of God, which is between us, all of us uh, and beyond us, but between us. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, Eileen was next, if I've got the hands right. Nope. It's uh, Brenda, Ted, and Eileen, I think. So, Brenda? Brenda. Okay. Hi. Is it me? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Uh, thank you, William. That was uh, really lovely. Um. And I, I have a question. You touched on the word, you used the word prophecy. Um, uh, and yet, in this experience, this final beyond time and space experience at the end there, what, what does, how do we read all the prophecy that has moved the poem, the 99 cantos or the 98 cantos? before uh, right. versus that final glorious moment of the poem? A big question because That's in some just ways- That's Something yes, to think about. Something some to think ways, about. It could you know, undermine, it, uh, it throws it all up for grabs in a certain way because everything that Dante has said, you know, as, Prophet is sort of, is humanly contaminated. Um, I think what I would say he offers it up. You know, he he cannot be sure. You know that it's true, but it has to be verified. I think by individuals and by the the collectivity, the the the, the church and and beyond the church, the I don't know what the, the human community. Um, you know whether the, the the specific prophecies. You know Dante's come down hard, uh, it, it, but yeah. on the basis of his own emotions and his own commitments. But I think the final image then does throw that back up to you know to, to to question in in specific circumstances. Then that has to be negotiated with other human beings. You know nobody knows alone exactly what's what's true. He that's been a, he's evoke that fiction at certain points and delivering his oracular statements and condemning individuals. That's what makes his poem so exciting. And, and 
but I think th that's so, why I, I mean, really want to emphasize. What about Saint Peter? What about Saint Peter's condemnation? You know, he's right up there in heaven too. What about Peter's condemnation of the world? That doesn't doesn't it? You know, at this point, none of that matters. Peter clearly cares still about the world. Yes. And so does Dante, absolutely. And Akash made the, the, the point some sessions ago that, sure, that, you know, it's very much about this world, Dante's prophecies. Um, I, I think that what the the, the final canto and, and, and the final vision add to our understanding of prophecy it is, as it has evolved through the course of the Commedia is that it's open. These are, you know, um, Dante expresses what he sees and feels. Um, that's what we all have to do. But God's ultimate judgment is, is beyond. He, even his prophetic you know, enunciation. Mm -hmm. There, there, there's a kind of a, a, a mystic truth that hovers above and qualifies um, the, you know, what, what would seem to be such apodictic statements on Dante's part, beyond, you know, without appeal, um, without. You know. uh, <laughs> so, it's you know, problem. there is really this dialectic, right? There's the dialectic between Dante's yes. certitude yeah. and, you know, He's he's so um, you know definite about everything, and he has to be that. But that's poetry in a certain sense, um, and and poetry is so important, nevertheless, for mediating what is divine revelation. And I, I'm saying that no, divine revelation really does come in poetry that we make it, um, and you know, but it it all remains open. I think to our negotiations with with one another um in determining you know what what really is is right for any of us and and for all of us um and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, okay. so, so that you know the point about that the mystic vision is that it cannot be expressed that all of the expressions and the formulas are are not really it we have to be open to it which is also to one another if we're going to allow the truth to happen, take hold of us, remake us. Uh, Ted? Thank. Thank you, William. And beautifully written as always. Thanks very much. Um, on the null though, I just wanted to mention there's a very fine recent study by uh, Paola Tricomi, Fido Nodo Tessitura Una Tassonomia di Imagini Dantesche, which was published by Edizioni dell'Orso in 23. Since the senior, I just thought I'd throw that in. And then on the question of prophecy, just a, you know, just an editorial comment. I feel like there's so much yet to be done about prophecy in Dante because he's so careful, I think, in the way that he manages what, you know, what's a prophecy, what's not, not a prophecy, what is, who's delivering the prophecy, how, you know, the whole categorization of prophecy in the poem, it, it feels like to me, could be worth a lot more study. My my quite I had a, two questions really they're kind of related William is I I to to what extent is it a a point of arrival an end but it's also a beginning I mean you're emphasizing the end very much but I kept it kept coming back to me and in fact in some of these passages for example when you talk about everything is an anticipation and anticipation but it's also a recollection right so I I wanted to ask you just in general um to what to what extent is a it a point of departure and then the second um I'm, and i'm referencing this last image that you i mean this first image that you started with la mia mente fu percossa da un fulgore and so on um and, the, and then the, the second question which is related to the first is have you thought 
much about the how the fulgore and the percuotere. It's such a signature, characteristic Dantean thing, the uh, theme, you know, and it, and it goes back to Amin Kresh, it goes back to um, the Montanina is right in this, I think. Um, and Paul, of course, you know, on the road to Damascus, but it's always in in his the signature way that he develops it, it's always the start of something new, you know? It's always like a, a transitional motif to build, you know, building out. Um, and, and, and so as, as I was listening to you and I was reading you, I was, I was thinking, you know, it's, it's, it, there's almost a kind of syntax to it that I wonder if could be, um, you know, if, if you would, you know, if, if that makes sense to you and if, and if, if it um, yes. could be expanded. Well, it, does, on. You know, it does make sense. And, you know, syntax is a way of, of making sense, of, of, of giving sense to something that transcends sense in the end. So, you know, definitely that's, that is a, a very worthwhile project, one that I'm, I, you know, I, I feel quite intrigued by as you articulate it. But I do think that it's not really definitive that you know the, uh, the the syntax of the fulgore, if that's the image that we're going to follow. The point of that image is that it comes from above and that it destroys, in a certain sense, your own framework um, and makes you begin again, as as you suggest. And sure, the work of the philologist then is to, to create a syntax, um, to you know, trace the, the evolution of, of an image. And you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Um, it does then you know, lead to a, a speculative moment where you know, like the, you know, the, the oracles of Sybil that, you know, that fly every, every which way, uh, it, you know, the, the, the syntax comes undone at a certain point, but that doesn't mean that you should abandon it. Look, you know, it's because of this poem, right? Which, you know, as you point out, everything, you know, Dati is so careful, as you say, uh, um, you know, every kind, every prophecy is qualified in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and those are essential. You know, that's, that's our process. As, as human beings, but we do then relate beyond this rational process. And Dante's are a rationalist, we know that, but a rationalist really then turns towards an, an ultimate mysticism where the, you know, the, all of the, the fine distinctions that he's made about <laughs> prophecy are, to, you know, they are, are human rational distinctions and um, they, they're necessary for us to live as human rational creatures. But there's an ultimate crowning instance that takes us beyond all of that as well. And Dante does relate um, everything to that ultimate moment and you know, to the ultimate he calls God. Uh, there's a, and so there's a tension, I think, between um, you know, between for, for, for us, you know, researchers of the poem, the, you know, the more philological projects and then the, you know, that, that speculative elan, but I, they, they have to work together and, and intention, I think, in order to be productive. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Eileen? Um, as usual, I'm going to give a, 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 um, excuse for this because I am the person who comes from outside Dante studies. Um, I'm having studied all of these other earlier visions of heaven and hell or even contemporaneous ones. I'm really shocked at, at Dante's courage in taking on this description of his experience. Um, there is this tension, as you mentioned, between his interest in this world and the, the other world and the mystical vision. And it's a tension that in these, these other visions, um, 
the people, they go into it with a concern about this world. They get to a point where they are in paradise. They almost see the vision. They see the light. They actually never, most of them never really get far enough to experience it. Or if they do, they're totally defeated by it. So that, you know, they, it, it is an ineffable, ineffable experience for them. And what happens is they basically come back and they're barely able to recount their experience. Someone records it for, for them. And the fascinating thing about Dante is rather than being defeated by this experience, he's actually emboldened by it to write this enormous work. Um, where does that come from? Uh, well, um, he, he, he's an extraordinary, extraordinarily confident, cantankerous character, and you know, daring. Um, comes from from character, certainly to some extent. But I, I think that he acknowledges um, his inadequacy to, you know, the to be able to communicate directly that final vision um he obsessively he acknowledges it in the ineffability topos all throughout but i you know i take your point that there's a you know a kind of of difference and maybe it also comes from his absolutely extraordinary talent as a poet realizing what can be done with poetry with human making that it can actually embody God in some sense. Um, and, and not only, you know, remain in, in, in absolute awe, you know, withering, um, and that there is actually a, a human vocation to divinization, right? You know, the, 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 the fathers certainly mapped that out for us. And you know, extraordinary human talent and, and ability. Although, you know, the Gospels, you know, the, it, what's extraordinary is the simplicity of heart, right? And the downtrodden, you know, that's also, you know, that really is also where we, we, we have to find these extraordinary resources. And, you know, Dante acknowledges that as well. But there's a, you know, there is a, a place for extraordinary human intellectual capability and poetic talent, you know, which are maybe part of the, the, the answer to the question that you raise. It takes Dante uh, in some ways in order to, you know, to, I think he goes through that phase, you know, that uh, of, you know, absolute, you know, non le proprie penne, uh, non fure a ciò le proprie penne, he, you know, he can't do it by his own powers. Um, but what he can do with his own powers, he will. And he does offer that. But it's always offered under the proviso of sort of, you know, God willing. And it's only what God does with the poetry that Dante offers, what God does in the hearts and souls of readers that can make it true revelation. And, I, you know, he, he acknowledges that in, in various ways. Uh, so. Thank um, you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I love Eileen's comment because, at least for someone like me, it, it really changes perspective. The idea that what what is peculiar about Dante's vision with respect to these other vernacular visions is not it's being political in a sense. It's being directed to this world. But it's that he actually, you know, goes really into the mystical. And I feel it's something that perhaps we don't emphasize enough. Um, so I really love that. And on that note, um, and you know it's late, but I, I, another aspect of imagination that um, I was wondering if you like to develop more or not is imagination, like human imagination, as uh, evidence of God existence, which is something that comes up in some of the discussions, and of course, you know, it has uh, Platonic uh, roots in itself. The idea of you know having these eternal ideas. Um, but 
I was wondering if you see any of that in Dante and and if you think you're gonna discuss that because I, I feel it might have an interesting hook for modern readers. Um, the idea of imagination, you know, the religious dimension of imagination, if we want to um right, yeah. Well, of course, you know, Dante's medieval culture gives him more typically a negative spin on imagination, um, you know, which leads you astray from, you know, what reason is, is the more reliable guide. But I, I think there is the nascence of a, a romantic imagination. Uh, you know, of course, you know, I, I'll be told, you know, don't confuse, you know, Dante with romantics, but what he does with imagination is actually opening the path and it leads, you know, Shelley, for example, and you know, a whole slew of romantic poets will, will realize this in their appropriation of, of Dante. Um, so yes, I, you know, I, I, I do think imagination, um, is a revelation in some sense, you know, almost per se. Uh, and, you know, we don't, I, I don't like to start from you know, any idea, you know, what is God or, 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 or divinity? Um, you know, it's sort of the negative theological apophatic strain in me it says, you know, we don't really know that. We, we work through the imagination. Um, also, you know, reason, uh, you know, Kant's critiques of pure reason also really come to a kind of apprehension of, of divinity. And it's actually where, where, where the two cross and cross fertilize that, you know, as in Dante um, and, and in, you know, many romantic thinkers, Coleridge, uh, that I, I think we can you know, find the, you know, the, the case for imagination that, that I hear in, in your remark. And yeah, um, you know, you, it was your title really that singled that out. It's, you know, I've not given particular focus to, to that concept, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, very happy to, to take it up. You that can't do everything, of course, but as you were talking, I just thought, you know, it might be interesting. I don't know, but. So I guess this is time to just remind us all uh, to be back here uh, on April 5th when <clears throat> Brian Reynolds will be um, giving his presentation. Um, this was really wonderfully illuminating. Uh, thank you, William, and uh, thank us all. This was just terrific. Um, Thank you all. Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a la próxima. Okay. Yeah. A la próxima. I'm just going to add that Brian is going to talk about Mary in Paradiso, the Virgin Mary in Paradiso, uh, on the on April April fifth, and the title of his episode episode twelve is Flower of Humanity, the Virgin Mary in Paradiso. And it will focus particularly on Paradiso 23 and on Paradiso 31 to 33. Uh, if if any of our participants want to read ahead. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.